I'm delighted to be here with Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, who's Associate Professor uh, of Medicine and Epidemiology at the Yale School of Medicine, is in charge there of their health equity research, and is also head of uh, President Biden's task force on um, health equity. Um, so it's a great pleasure to, to be with you, Dr. Nunez-Smith. Um, couldn't think of a better time in America's history than um, today of talking about health equity because of what the pandemic has exposed. But of course, there was gross health inequity prior to the pandemic as well. Um, talk to us a little bit about what the pandemic has exposed in terms of inequities in America as a country and as, in its cities. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and so uh, really appreciate being in conversation with you today. I mean, I think it is uh, so true that as a nation, we've just had a collective witnessing this past year, now year plus. Uh, I think for some people, sadly, it was predictable that we were gonna see the patterns we've seen in terms of who's been most affected negatively by COVID-19, both in terms of uh, case burden, as well as hospitalization rates, and sadly, loss of life. And then uh, as a sort of accompanying reality, you know, the economic suffering has also been uneven in our country and those same patterns. But there have been other people, I think, for whom um, there has been a, a, a new understanding and appreciation of just how deep and entrenched the social and structural inequities really are um, and have been and just how much work we have to do. And so, you know, whether or not we uh, have a conversation, as, as I often say, in our country, race and place are just extraordinary drivers of health and health outcomes and often the lack thereof. And so we see the overrepresentation, for example, of people of color in some of these jobs that have been deemed essential, really putting themselves and their families at risk, homes that are often multi-generational, where they have family members themselves who are at risk. And whether we talk about the longstanding exposures to environmental toxins, the inability to access high quality health care, all the things that drive those comorbid conditions we so often refer to as increasing one's risk for severity in terms of COVID-19 and its outcomes. You know, we're already seeing disparities in terms of who is living with long COVID and that syndrome of COVID. So there are a lot of implications that have to do with our social structural realities. We're seeing people now as a result of the economic fallout, higher rates of housing, instability, nutrition and food insecurity, and our cities, to your point, you know, 80% of Americans in our cities. And so uh, just critical for us to be able to name now, but more importantly, intervene. Um, if you think of um, where I'm based, and I know where you'll be visiting often, um, the District of Columbia, 45% African-American, 76% of deaths um, from COVID-19 African-American have been African-American, um, but only about a quarter of the vaccinations. And you, you go to sort of other parts of this town, I'm in Northwest, a relatively privileged area, but if you go to less privileged areas, you'll see um, the the lines around the block are more white than you would expect them to be. Um, that there seems to be a problem with getting equity in vaccination rates. How big a problem is is that, um, and and how do you think it's going to be addressed? Yeah, I'm really grateful that you raised this issue in terms of inequity in terms of the vaccine uptake. You know. Uh, absolutely, all of us need to do more. That's not acceptable for the outcomes we need to see. Um, it, it, it's exactly the way that you framed it. It's how I think about it, that we should be seeing vaccine uptake that is at least in proportion to the representation of, of different groups in the overall population, if not skewed, given, as you said, that there are some communities that have been harder hit and are at highest risk. So, you know, there is work to do. I, you know, I often say the conversation is around, you know, access and acceptance. And let me just spend a moment saying uh, something about acceptance. We need to meet people where they are and build confidence in the vaccines. We currently have three, three vaccines in the United States that are approved for emergency use. All three of them are very safe and highly effective on the things that we care about, right? Preventing severe illness, hospitalization, and death. So it's just critical that we make sure everybody has the information that they need about the vaccines. But I don't want us to, to be um, sort of lulled into thinking that we have a great challenge in terms of people's readiness. You know, I hear much more about people who are eligible and ready. There are, they're at yes 
and they have a hard time connecting with vaccine. And so we have prioritized in the federal administration making sure that people have access, right? Vaccination needs to be easy, convenient, it's free. But what do we mean by that? You know, we've stood up in the first few weeks and have expanded on these um, several federal programs. So in addition to the vaccine that we we allocate to states and local jurisdictions, we also have direct federal vaccine allocations to specific programs, such as our community vaccination centers. And those are located in these very communities that are most at risk, right? And so that is using the CDC Social Vulnerability Index to make sure, or we're using best practices, right? Making sure that there are extended hours that you can register through faith and community-based organizations, that there is targeted eligibility, so prioritizing those zip codes as Washington DC has done. And so other best practices, being sure that we are in good partnership to get those vaccines to who most needs them. Same for the retail pharmacy program, a third of those located in high risk neighborhoods and communities. Also, um, very importantly, our community health center program. And so very specifically reaching out to those healthcare providers that provide service to those people whose lives are in fact, most often very much affected by these social structural inequities. Um, and then we have mobile units to get vaccination to people when needed. So we're very intentional um, about access and we work closely with states and localities to make sure they're very intentional about improving access as well. Um, I want to get under the state um, and city bit in one second, but just to follow up on that, do you have a sense of um, what share of the problem is to do with lack of access to say a, you know digital broadband so that you can understand when appointments are available and when um, the vaccine or you're eligible for the vaccine um, versus historic very very good reasons for mistrust in public health um, amongst certain minority communities not just african-american um, these are sort of two separate problems right well, yeah, I do think they are. I do think they are linked because I think one of the ways that you kind of address uh, what you have rightly described as a sometimes healthy skepticism um, is by showing up and making access convenient and easy. I mean, you know, to your point, the the president has acknowledged on more than one occasion that you know people of color, others in this country, have not really always been treated with the dignity, the respect that they deserve from scientific institutions or from the federal government. And so we have to start there with that acknowledgement. Um, and I think it's really important to say that these institutions have earned the distrust of these communities. And so we don't often have to look at historical context. Unfortunately, people have contemporary examples in their own lives and the lives of people in their family who have sought care potentially um, and experienced you know, bias or mistreatment. So we have to, be really clear about acknowledging um, and recognizing that reality. Yet I say, you know, that is not a reason to deny um, oneself, one's family, one's community access to the scientific discovery that is life protecting and preserving, particularly in some of the communities that have been hardest hit. But we absolutely need to acknowledge that. Also need to acknowledge the disinformation and misinformation campaigns that are out there, and I and in, and unfortunately are sometimes targeting. Um, these very communities. And I think that is uh, unacceptable uh, and it has the potential to be devastating. So, you know, that's on the one side is, is acknowledging that. But absolutely the digital divide, as you point out, it's key that people be able, it, it does not need to be a matter of kind of who can connect to the internet fastest, um, you know, who speaks English the best, uh, who has the highest degree of tech literacy. All of these are, are challenges that we've seen. We're addressing those. Um, the president just announced being able to centralize some of these resources, both in terms of a website, but also an accessible call center. And very key is being able to coordinate your registration through whoever you trust, whether that be a community-based organization, a faith-based organization, really key that the strategies include ways for people to connect with registration um, that also meet them where they are. So unfortunately, there's only time for one more question. So let me ask you about the uh, this big 1.9 trillion um, pandemic relief bill passed last week, um, which um, includes several hundred billion for cities uh, and state governments. What what impact do you think that's going to have on everything we've been talking about? Yeah, it's going to be transformative. You know, this is a good moment in our country not only because of the scientific discovery we talked about before, you know, being able to have vaccine, also to have many therapeutics 
um, we don't talk about as much, but we have COVID-19 resources that can be brought to bear. And now we have the federal resources to do that. You know, the American Rescue Plan uh, is ambitious and bold because it, it needed to be. That's what the country absolutely needs at this moment. And so, you know, being able to provide directly to over 19,000 cities and towns the resources that they need to be able to carry out vaccination campaigns that will be successful, that will reach all their communities, all their residents, critical. But there's also so much more. Uh, and so transformative is what I would say. I think this is a very, um, very welcome and needed uh, intervention and resources, but very hopeful for so many reasons. I mean, we're getting close to being able to see the other side and get to our new normal uh, for so many reasons. And the resources in the ARP, definitely necessary and key in that toolbox. Well, Dr. Nunez Smith, thanks so much for, for joining us and best of luck with your, your very important work. Thank you. Be well.